Joining us right now, I want to bring in my good friend Matt Mayoko from the NBC Bay Area Sports. Uh, Matt is a longtime 49ers uh, writer, beat reporter. He's done it all. He's doing a lot of TV now. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. We know you're at a fantastic fundraising golf tournament today, too, so we really appreciate you taking a couple minutes. Oh, always my pleasure. Yeah, raising raising money for a good a cause. Uh, Jim Capu, an officer in, in Vallejo, uh, killed in the line of duty, uh, what, 12 years ago. So police athletic league fundraiser for him. So, uh, but always a pleasure, Steve, to see you because when I know, when I see you <laughs> in Santa Clara, 49ers land, I know the 49ers are relevant and I've seen you a lot. So I know the 49ers have been relevant now for several years. That is a great, great chance. Because before we get to Brock Purdy and Fred Warner and all these guys, I want to discuss this because the Niners are playing the Browns this week. Okay, and the Browns are right now with Deshaun Watson not playing. Oh, we're a team in perpetual doom and gloom. They've yet to establish a culture, basically, since they've been back uh, in Cleveland after, you know, they were taken away to Baltimore and all that. So we're not going to get into that. But you've you've covered some lean times with the with the 49ers. And look, you you had the Jim Tom Sula, which dovetailed into the Chip Kelly era. That record of seven and twenty-five total before Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch took over. Both first timers in those positions, Matt. What have they done to actually flip the culture to where now the expectation is winning, not just in games, winning every day of practice? I would say it starts before John and Kyle's arrival. Uh, when when the four years were going through that rough patch, there it, the the organization was completely dysfunctional with general manager and head coach often not seeing eye to eye, uh, maybe at times even when things started to go wrong, pulling in opposite directions. And so what Jed York, the CEO, decided was that he looked up north into the Pacific Northwest and said, that's the kind of organization I want. So he actually used the Seattle Seahawks, John Schneider, Pete Carroll as the template for what he wanted the 49ers to be. So it's basically... You know, he went out and found Kyle Shanahan first and then basically allowed Kyle Shanahan to find a general manager that he felt he could work with. And, you know, I think a surprise to everybody at the time, the guy he he decided on was John Lynch, who had never been in an NFL front office, had done just a little bit of scouting, consulting work with the Broncos. But really the dynamic at the very top Kyle and John, they work so well together. Uh, they're always on the practice field talking. They have their disagreements, but they work through it. Uh, no one's ever going to try to you know, force a player or something down the other one's throat that he doesn't want. So it really starts right there. And I think that really transforms its way or carries down to the locker room where everybody can see, all the players can see that the two guys who are the most powerful people in the football organization are in it together and I mean, you've been in that locker room. Yeah. It's a very selfless locker room. And with so many offensive stars, no one's crying for the football. So it's it, they've really done a, a great job of establishing that team culture. And I think having a Hall of Fame safety like John Lynch in charge of player acquisition, he's able to look beyond just what a guy can bring on the field. But he also pays particular attention to what a player brings off the field in the locker room as well. Yeah, I mean, you look, that chemistry is, is a huge thing. And some teams, they may have the good leadership, you know, from the top of the building, but they can't assemble that chemistry with the players or a coaching staff like these guys have done. And remember, this is a coaching staff that's got continual drain on it because the assistants keep getting hired away. One thing I, I really appreciate about Kyle and John and, and some of the assistant coaches they have there is the transparency, right? Their openness to kind of be pretty honest, you know, the, the majority of the time. And I think that's a trickle down to the players as well, because when I see you and others and we, we interview them, there's really no pullback. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's a really good culture there. You talked about player acquisition, Brock Purdy, dumb luck or or just saying we did like this guy and he still happened to be there when he came around when we picked in the seventh round. That's a little bit of both. I, I know when the the quarterbacks coaches, uh, Clay Kubiak 
and uh, Brian Greasy, Kubiak being the assistant quarterbacks coach, Brian Greasy, the, the main quarterbacks coach, when they were tasked with the assignment of here's a list of guys who are late round or undrafted guys, who do you like? It came back. The consensus was Brock Purdy. So, you know, we, we can give the 49ers a lot of credit for selecting Brock Purdy, but also if they knew he was anywhere near this good, they wouldn't have waited until the final <laughs> pick in the draft to take him. But I think it speaks to just how sometimes you just don't know until you get the guy in the building and maybe at that position more than any other where, yeah, I, I remember talking to people that draft night, people with the 49ers and they kind of, dismissed it a little bit as uh you know he he's he's kind of like nick mullins no disrespect to nick mullins he's still <laughs> a backup in the league he's gonna be you know nick mullins has already played a long time in the nfl yes, he has. but you know no one uh no one thought that that brock purdy would be able to step in in the middle of his rookie season and then just lock down the starting job to the point where now he that position is considered you know in very good hands for the foreseeable future including this year and next year for sure playing for the minimum salary brock purdy is an mvp candidate and he's the 47th highest paid player on the 49ers 53 man <laughs> roster i mean you, you you think about that and and that's where you're like wow they really did strike gold and and you know the the thing when I look at Brock Purdy and, and, and watching Kyle Shanahan and the evolution of this offense and things like this, everyone's like, Brock Purdy is a system guy. He runs Kyle's offense the right way. And and you would know this, and this is just me observationally, but to me, he has allowed Kyle to expand his playbook in a way that we haven't seen Kyle run this offense before. And, am, am I off base in watching this, or are they doing more things, not because of the chess pieces, but because they've got Brock Purdy. Kyle Shanahan has more trust in Brock Purdy for sure than any quarterback he's had with the 49ers. Just the ability, the, the confidence that he feels in installing a game plan. I mean, case in point, 49ers had a Thursday night game uh, week three. So you would think that the playbook, the, uh, the game plan would be kind of a stripped down version. It was a regular game plan plus they put so much in for that Thursday night game against the giants. Why? Because Kyle Shanahan has confidence that Brock Purdy can handle it. So it's, it's all of the adjustments off of the adjustments, all the motions, all the, the shifts, all the variations of certain plays it's it, he puts a lot on his plate and Brock Purdy has shown that he can handle all of that. So what, what Kyle Shanahan hates more than anything is to tell a quarterback during the course of the week, here's the play call. Here's the defense. You're going to see this is going to be open. And when that play comes on Sunday, if it's that play call and if it's that defense and the guy is open, and the quarterback doesn't see him or the ball's going somewhere else, Kyle Shanahan, that drives him crazy. You you would often see in Shanahan's first few years with the 49ers, and I'm sure every coordinator job he's been, you know, he he would be a horrible poker player because you can tell <laughs> what's what's going on. Right. You would see the clips on the sideline, maybe him just in the background, throwing his hands up, you know, showing some form of disgust because the quarterback did not do what he was told to do or what he was instructed to do. You haven't seen any of that with Brock Purdy. And Matt, mind you, he is coming off of significant surgery to his arm. Real quick, Matt, you know, we, we know that Brock Purdy's first win came against Tom Brady. Listen to what Tom Brady had to say about Brock Purdy. You don't hear of guys like Brock Purdy until Brock Purdy's doing amazing things out on the field. So it's kind of a fun story. And, and I hope it continues for him because he seems like he's a really humble you know, young man, and and he wants to go out there and do great things. And people, the you know, I think the more you kind of have that chip on your shoulder like he does, and there were not quite the expectations, it's nice to go out there and continue to prove people wrong. You know, it's nice to have people that can show up every day, put the team first, do what they're asked to do. And, you know, he's done a good job of that. He's really exceeding a lot of people's expectations. 
and that came from Brady's uh, Let's Go podcast that he does with Jim Gray and Larry Fitzgerald. But hearing that from a late round draft pick quarterback who's the greatest of all time, there is some type of synchronicity, so to speak, I guess, at least for the, the mental aspect of it that he has with Brock Purdy. Yeah, he probably sees a lot of himself in in Brock Purdy. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're different body types or different skill sets, but kind of the the same general idea applies to both. You know, the, the late round draft pick who felt like, uh, you know, he was underestimated in the case of Brock Purdy. He was told he was irrelevant. And, you know, before he knew what that meant, you know, the whole festival uh, down in Newport Beach in, in uh, Southern California, the mystery relevant right. festival, you know, that kind of early on, I think Brock wasn't too fond of hearing his name associated with Mr. Irrelevant. Um, but, you know, it's it's the 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 measurables are one thing. You know, the velocity on the football, the 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 height, the the weight, the speed, all that. But so much of playing quarterback are the things you can't see, and maybe only the things uh, it, the quarterback can see. I mean, I, I kind of I feel like Brock Purdy has this rare ability, as did Tom Brady, of seeing, and very few quarterbacks, by the way had this ability to basically see a picture of the field a second and a half or two seconds before that actually occurs. I mean, you watch some of the throws that Brock Purdy makes and when he's letting the football you know, release when he's throwing it, there's, you know, you, if you pause the film, nobody's open. And it's that anticipation of knowing where those windows are going to come open and, and his ability to, to deliver it accurately, precisely, timing, rhythm, and all that, uh, that that's really the strength that Brock Purdy has. In addition to all those intangibles, he's well-liked in the, in yes. the locker room and, and everything else. And, and, and you know what? He, he's got that killer, right? He's got that Joe Burrow, okay, you're going to give me an opening. I'm going to freaking squeeze my way through it. Matt, th- but some of those things you were just talking about are some of the things we were saying four or five years ago about Russell Wilson, who now – with the Denver Broncos, it is not going well. He comes off a performance Thursday night in a loss to Kansas City where he throws for less than 100 yards. You are a pro football Hall of Fame selector, and I am someone who's very involved with the Hall, although not a, a selector. It seemed as though Russell was on his way to join the greats in Canton. Is there, at this stage of his career, and we're just talking not even one and a half seasons with the Denver Broncos, but also maybe the last couple of seasons with the Seahawks that he is playing his way out of a legitimate shot to join the pro football hall of fame. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one way to put me on the spot. Hey man. Steve. Hey, man. Uh, that's, hey, no, I, I would say this. I mean, I, I watch Russell Wilson play a lot, you know, at least twice a year uh, covering the 49ers and seeing him just destroy the 49ers and, and many uh, iterations of the 49ers. So, you know, clearly there was a point, you know, late in, in his Seahawks days where th- that wasn't even a conversation, right? I mean, right. won a Super Bowl, been to another. Uh, but I, I would say that, yeah, absolutely. There's some pause now. Um, you know, that time is going to come up at some point. I, I don't know when he's, you know, when his final season's going to be and then it's five years after that when he becomes eligible for the hall of fame but but you you look at you know there's so many hall of fame worthy quarterbacks um you know just in the recent past you know guys who haven't uh, come up yet and guys who are playing now so is he a slam dunk absolutely not is he still in that conversation and in, in that very serious conversation absolutely yes so it's the, the the roughest part about the pro football hall of fame is that we can only select you know the bylaws stipulate only five modern era players can be selected every year so that's why you know, it takes some people so long to get there because you might be, you know, sixth on that list one year. And then the next year, here come, you know, four or five 
really quality candidates and it just keeps you know it just it's it's a it's a numbers game it's difficult to figure out but I, I would say right now I would not consider Russell Wilson a lock I I think that he still has a, a very strong argument but but not a lock yeah he's he's probably right now in the whole Philip Rivers Matthew Stafford type of discussion like they've done the great things but have they done enough to breathe yeah. the rarest air Matt real quick before we let you go Randy Gregory uh, now with the 49ers, you know, Chris Kacarek, the best defensive line coach in the NFL, he's joining the part of the team that is the strongest, which is amazing when you think about all the great talent they have on that team. What type of impact could he have like, like it, soon? Yeah, he, it could be very impactful because I would say on that defensive line, the one area where they're looking to upgrade would be the edge rusher opposite of Bosa. And so to bring in Randy Gregory, maybe even Sunday as a pass rush specialist, put your hand in the ground, go get the quarterback. And Chris Kosarek's already working him up. If you ever seen the practices, he's in those guys' faces and he's all about the get off. And so it, it, Randy Gregory has a great attitude. When I spoke to him Wednesday coming in, he said, no expectations. I want to fit in wherever they want me. They know what I can do. You know, I know what I can do. And so, you know, he wants to just kind of accentuate all those positives. And so that would be an area where uh, if Randy Gregory plays up to that vast, vast potential that he has, Man, I, I don't know if it'd be a game changer for the 49ers because they're already really good, but it could take them to an even higher level. Oh, he could be a game changer. I mean, when you think about Armstead and, and Kinlaw and Bosa, and then you're you're rotating, you know, Har well, you got Hargrave in there too, and you yeah. got Drake Jackson. I mean, they've got depth and they have got a lot of high end talent. Matt Mayoko, thank you so much for taking your time, giving that insight. Hit them straight for a great cause up there at that golf tournament, my man. All right, Steve. Always my pleasure, and I have a feeling I'll be seeing you real soon again. I really hope so. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.